thanks for sticking around to the end. I see a lot of people had to leave, unfortunately, but uh, some really good material here. And hopefully the ones that uh, weren't able to stick around will um, heed my tweet that says, even if you can't be here, you really, really should be doing uh, unit testing in your, in your databases. Um, quick blurb about me. Um, some of you, if you've ever seen Pulp Fiction, you might get the, the wolf reference. Uh, there was a really big mess in that movie if you've ever seen it. Uh, and Winston Wolf was the gentleman that got called in to teach him how to clean up the mess. Um, I've given somewhere around 100 SQL Saturdays I've been to as a presenter. And every now and then, about once a year, once every other year, somebody would ding me for being cocky when I say I'm world class, so I changed it to better than average, even though they see that number. And if you do the same thing for that many hours, you should be pretty darn good at it, I think. I love doing performance uh, tuning type stuff. That's kind of most of my consulting business. Uh, I've been doing consulting for almost 20 years in SQL Server. Uh, I'm not a BI person, uh, but I know some really good ones. And if you need some help, I can make some introductions uh, for that. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, what unit testing really is, uh, and certainly from a database side perspective. Um, and what kind of things do we do to accomplish that? Uh, and then how do we do it in T-SQL land, uh, including a, a quick review, if we have time, of a, a product from Redgate that helps to kind of make it a little more user friendly. So it's unit testing is code that exercises a specific section of your code. And it has a known set of inputs and a known expected set of outputs and it simply says boolean yes or no or true or false about whether we we passed that particular test and the good thing is you want to be able to set this up so that you can either manually or preferentially automatically respond to uh, pass or fail events on your suite of tests that you create uh, such as moving it forward in a, in a rollout scenario to test or QA or, or some kind of bed. And we want to be able to um, find the mistakes in our code, no matter whether the logical or uh, you know, procedural or, or what have you. The sooner we find mistakes uh, in what we're developing, uh, the better it's going to be. Because the, the longer some code has been around or, or a project has been out in production, uh, the more difficult, risky, complex, costly it is to actually fix those problems, right? And the real payoff of creating the tests is in having um, the tests be repeatable such that you can make a refactor or a change or add some functionality and you run your existing suite of tests and they will confirm to you that based on what you built your test to do, they say you didn't break something that already existed. And that kind of uh, you know, avoidance of future problems is critically important. And that's true even if you're doing classic old school waterfall development, but it's just extremely, extremely important if you're doing some form of agile or, or more modern rapid cycle development where you're constantly going in and changing stuff that's already been built and perhaps even released. Uh, and clearly, uh, another goal is to make your tests really small. You don't want to create this one monolithic test that does 49 different things. Because then if something goes sideways, you have to spend a lot of time figuring out where in the tree of what that you know, unit test was doing uh, do you actually need to go and, and adjust some refactor or fix some code. <clears throat> and again, uh, another thing is, uh, a lot of modern development is moving towards test-driven development, where you actually write tests to prove that the code is going to do something before you write the code that is actually going to accomplish that. And with uh, the, the stuff that I'm going to show you, you can actually do that much more effectively inside the database than we've been able to do before. Is anyone here actually using uh, some form of database-focused unit testing at this point? Uh, yeah, that's one or two, that's usually about all I get when I talk about this. Um, I've been to clients that have hundreds of thousands of .NET-based unit tests, 
and zero that actually do something inside the database platform, whether it's SQL Server or otherwise. And where are your problems going to occur? <laughs> a lot of times it's going to be with things that actually manipulate the data inside the database. So, um, And having that confidence to know I built some code, I changed that code, and things still work the way they're supposed to uh, is something that uh, carries a lot of benefit. Although it's difficult perhaps to monetize that benefit, uh, right? And it, you can also use it to, uh, if you have coding standards, you can use unit tests to actually enforce those, those coding standards. Um, I think that's more common outside the database, um, but certainly it can be done inside the, the database as well. Um, it's kind of infeasible unless you really are a true test-driven development shop to test every single thing. Um, so you, you have to try to figure out what you're going to go after and what kind of things you'll, you'll let uh, reside outside of that. Um, and that comes with experience, know what things are more risky or, or problematic uh, than other things might be. Uh, a lot of uh, activity that you're going to do is going to require more than one test because a different input or type of inputs uh, may exercise different pieces of the code uh, and you, or you may expect different types of output. Um, so you got all your normal stuff, edge conditions, never forget your boundary type conditions, right? If range of values that are the endpoints, you know, say a tiny n is, you know, 0, 255 or whatever, what happens if you have inputs that are outside of the acceptable boundaries? Uh, are you throwing the appropriate errors or is, is something unfortunate happening? Um, and one that almost nobody thinks of is, is the nullability situation, right? I always advise uh, my clients and their developers to try to design nulls out of the database if they can, because if they're in there in columns, you're no longer dealing with Boolean true or false in your logic. It's true, false, or this nebulous null thingy, and you have to sprinkle your code with is null, parentheses, my var, you know, my t column, comma, tick mark, tick mark, all that stuff, right? Um, but make sure you test what happens when you send a null in. Does it do the acceptable thing? Because so, in some cases, you can actually get bad data out, which is clearly the worst possible thing that can happen in uh, data processing. So it's going to take more work. It's going to slow down your development cycles to build unit tests because you're writing more code, right? And that's, that's going to take some time. Um, so you don't get to build the stuff as quickly or rapidly as perhaps you want to or certainly that uh, management might want to uh, unless they have good buy-off into testing. Um, from a management perspective, it can be hard for them to justify it because you can't necessarily quantify that I'm going to create, you know, 39% fewer bugs over the next two years of this life cycle of the product because I have good unit testing. Right? You, you can't necessarily put a hard number on there, although a number of studies have been done that show that you do have less problems in code where you do have good unit testing in place. Uh, and certainly a, a dollar value, right? How do you say that I'm going to save or generate or whatever, protect X amount of revenue or, or whatever? It's, it's a little difficult. So it's not integration testing. You're not exercising uh, that functionality works properly, um, that uh, data gets moved around properly. Um, system level testing, such as load testing, uh, things like that. Unit tests, unit is a very important word there. It's, it's a singular small piece of the whole pie that you're doing you still need to do all these other things, right? Where if you've got a situation where a user sees some data and they act upon that, and then it goes to five different other places before it finally hits your SAP system, which I recently came across at a client, uh, does the data represent everything at each one of those stops, and is the master copy in SAP representative of what the user saw or acted upon? Um, all of those things still need to be uh, tested and proven in your systems. So hopefully it does give you some peace of mind if you get into it. Um, I mentioned there were only a handful of people that did database level unit testing. How many people have unit tests in their you know, C Sharp or, or Ruby or, or outside the database type code? 
Do we have uh, significantly more, I would think, yeah. Still not enough, right? If, you're, if you can't verify that your code's doing what it's expected to do, um, you know, that should give you some pause, right? And I would be willing to bet that most of the people in here don't have fully baked QA type testing either, right? A lot of it, if it's done at all, is what I call hunt and peck. You got a user or two that just go up and just type in a few things and yeah, it completed. I have no idea that the data in the database reflects what I just did, but it didn't break, so I assume it works properly, right? That kind of stuff is, uh, uh, it just opens you up to a lot of problems, it really does. So there is code inside the database, clearly. Um, in stored procedures or functions, views, uh, a lot of things that we can do. Constraints can be considered a form of code. Triggers, um, your code could be auto-generated by in Hibernate or any framework or others, right? Um, so you're writing code now to generate other code. Um, but everything that happens in SQL Server, remember, is T-SQL at the end of the day, right? And no matter what GUI or tool or framework you're using, everything that happens is, is gonna be T-SQL in some way. So we could write a unit test that says my, my scalar function, which hopefully you're not using uh, scalar UDFs. Um, you should probably write that down. They're devastatingly bad uh, things to actually use in SQL Server. Um, and if you'd like, you can stay after and, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but if we want to write the code to say, what is this uh, UDF going to return for a certain input, um, I can do that. Uh, and then we may also want to write some code that says, uh, does it do something intelligent when it doesn't get an expected input? Right? And edge cases are boundary conditions. And again, when you're writing test code, look at the logic of what you wrote from a code perspective and make sure that you create tests that exercise uh, all of the areas or if you're not testing everything, the, the things that are, are most critical for the, the code evolution at hand. So. Let's take a quick look here. Um, we're in uh, AdventureWorks. Uh, it's freely available from CodePlex. There's you know, six or seven different variations now, one for a uh, number of the major versions of SQL Server. So it returns an invarchar taking a, a tiny int for a status. And basically, this is just a dictionary lookup, if you will, done in, a, in code to try to improve the performance to not have to do actual data lookups. Right. So it translates a value into a string. And I can write code that will say, I'm doing test one. I declare some stuff that I'm going to set up and or evaluate. And I exercise the code. And I simply output whether it passed or failed. And you can see here that I have some textual based output that says test one failed, right? And the, one of the downsides to that clearly is that being textual such as this, um, the ability to interact with it uh, is a bit limited, right? Um, but uh, that is a way to, to do that. Obviously, I can daisy chain these together in the same set of code T-SQL here or have separate objects that I might fire off via uh, some SQL command batch or something like that. And again, I, the standard way to do it is you set up what the expected and actual uh, values are, and you do some form of comparison. And again, test one, success. Test two did not pass. If I ran this after some code modification evolution, uh, I would go to here and say, uh, my code has affected what I had. I need to go fix the code change that I did. Or it may be that the business logic has changed and your code is correct and you simply now need to go and modify the test code to reflect the new business requirements. Right? And either side of those are, are acceptable answers. Uh, hopefully, if the business requirements changed, you would know from your impact analysis that was done that you need to go and change these uh, six unit tests to reflect the new expected output from your code, right? So, but either way, uh, I have some actionable item here on test two, whatever that was. 
So what about testing tables, right, and, the, and or the values that are tabular that come back from uh, stored procedures or uh, ad hoc statements that are thrown? Um, that can be a, a bit difficult, right, to compare the data output for a given uh, in set of inputs. Uh, what about the schemas? If uh, you change the schema of certain objects, you can wind up in a scenario where now your code just starts breaking on the front end or middle tier because you added a column or changed the column definition or something like that. So the, the schemas of the result sets are obviously also very important. <clears throat> constraints, right? Uh, sometimes constraints get in the way, especially if we're testing something not related to a constraint, and then they keep us from actually doing a test that is involving something that is not related to them. Uh, so that can be difficult. But on the other hand, sometimes you want to test a constraint where you can't put in a child record that doesn't yet have a parent record. And, that, and in that case, you want the constraint to fire and throw an error that is uh, appropriate uh, that you can act upon in your code. Um, so you have to figure out, do you want the constraints or not? And if you do, how are you going to handle that in your tests? And transactioning is, is clearly a way you can do this. Um, but if you stub up a table and you want to act upon it, uh, then you have to decide how do you recreate a copy of that table with or without the constraints uh, to do that. And that can be a lot of setup code and teardown code that you have to control manually in your scripts if you write tests like this. It's a lot of code just to get ready to actually do the test. Right? So that's something else that can uh, get in the way. What about triggers? Right? Uh, there's a lot of cases where business logic, not just auditing perhaps, uh, sits on the tables that you're going to be inserting, updating, deleting data to or from. And the action of those triggers could cause a test code to fail or do something unexpected. So you may not want them. In the other case, you clearly need to write tests to exercise the triggers if you have them. Um, so in that case, you would want them on there. More things that you have to control with the, the setup and teardown right, and think about. Uh, views, really, if you're testing views, well, I, I modify the view. I run a select statement. Uh, I get some data back. So my view must be correct, right? But again, schemas and the actual data itself, how do you compare that? Um, you would have to save a copy of the data that came out uh, and then run it with the same parameters as you did seven months ago when you last exercised that set of code uh, in testing and then somehow save the data and run a comparison. You know, are you doing a manual win merge? Uh, or some kind of uh, batch thing to compare the, the data that comes out for a given input. Uh, it's not, not very easy, right? So if you code in Visual Studio, it does offer abilities for you to write this type of code. But some of the things like, you know, mocking tables and, and stored procedures and things like that, tracking data outputs for given inputs are, are not necessarily easy. You may not have Visual Studio. You can get free copies of that, I believe. Um, so, but you may not be familiar with, uh, you know, how all the interface stuff works and uh, shortcuts for keyboards and all that. Um, but most developers uh, spend their time, a lot of their time, inside SSMS. So, uh, we're doing and writing T SQL, and here is the the fundamental basis of what we're going to be doing for testing inside our SQL Server is T SQL T, and it is at tsqlt.org. Um, a couple of really sharp people have spent a, a long time building a free uh, framework for us to use for our uh, unit testing. So key, key point, everything happens inside transactions. So I can do all kinds of activity. And when my test is complete, whether it passes, fails, or errors for some unexpected reason, the transaction will roll back, and nothing winds up permanently existing in my database, whether it's a schema, uh, an object, or a data type of manipulation. Uh, the tests, you create schemas that you put your, drop your tests into. 
uh, which allows you to organize them, obviously, because I'm testing my customer's table, and I have a customer's table test schema, and I can create 93 different tests that are in that schema. Uh, and with that, you can then, obviously, run the schema group as a whole, uh, which uh, provides benefits if you're making modifications to that particular subsection of code. Um, the output can be dropped into uh, the tools that you might use for uh, continuous uh, development, such as the, the Team City stuff. Uh, and there's a, there's a couple of them now that can use the output from T SQL T to make decisions on whether we're going to move forward with a, a rollout or a build, or we're going to send some emails or alerts that uh, certain things that have failed in our automated system. TSQLT.org, you just download it, um, run it up. It will build a sample database for you uh, that has uh, a lot of good stuff in it. Just take a quick peek here. So, and it comes with a full example that's documented on the website with a couple of tests that actually fail, and it walks you through just a quick, uh, you know, quick dive learning thing on how to make some changes to those tests. Uh, it also will compile uh, quite a bunch, as you see here, the SQL COP items that can test for things uh, that we might not want to uh, allow or have in our code, or, or settings of uh, you know, things like our database mail isn't enabled on a server. Right? So a lot of best practices are baked into the SQL COP tests that uh, come from the system right out of the box. Okay, so you prep it. There's a couple things you have to have. It has to have uh, alter authorization, uh, set trustworthy, and the CLR needs to be enabled. Um, uh, there are some DBAs out there that still don't understand that CLR can be a really good thing when done properly on your servers. Um, so if uh, you can't get that, hopefully on your dev and QA and test platforms, that's not really a concern. Um, if it is, if you can't get the CLR turned on, Unfortunately, there's, uh, you wouldn't be able to use the, the framework. Um, and then you just run the tsqlt.class script on the database, and it creates uh, the objects in the tsqlt schema that are required for the actual operation of the framework. And as you can see here, there's quite a lot of objects that come up that are used under the covers by the system. It's, it's really impressive. The awesome thing is, is that this is all code that's not encrypted, right? So if you need some new functionality, you just go in there and say, well, I'm going to fake, make a fake of a table. I need some new piece, and I'm going to build it in my own copy of the tsqlt.org. Uh, and there are some people out there that have extended the functionality, um, which is uh, quite interesting. Um, so we cre create our test class, which says what uh, is the name of the test class we're going to do. And we create a procedure that does this test. Prefix the name with test, and that's one of the ways that it can use to figure out which test that it wants to run. And then tsqlt.run, test name, will fire it off. Okay. Um, we'll take a look. One of the basic fundamentals of testing is an assertion. And that's the thing that says, is A equal to A, or is A not equal to A, uh, or did uh, something error out, right? And those type of assertions are the basic. And it doesn't matter really whether um, A and B are tables or scalars or uh, result sets or what have you, right? Uh, that an object exists, right? I need to know that this, this thing is in place, yes or no. Uh, is the table empty? Right? If you have a queue system and you expect a table to be empty when your code is done processing the queue, you can simply say assert that my queue table or my driver table is empty, and that's a, a simple test to do. Uh, one of the bread and butter ones, obviously, is assert equals, and then it's uh, corollary assert not equals. So you can say is A uh, equal to B as, a, as an assertion. Uh, likes exposes some of the regular expressionist capabilities of the like uh, clause so that you can do more in-depth string-based comparisons. And then another one, obviously, that's important is equals tables. And that's what allows you to say, I have a result set here, and I have my expected result set. Do a comparison of them. 
And note, it literally is just a dot assert equals table. You don't have to worry about checking that is a row here and not over there? Or is a row there and not over here? Or are there rows that are equal on some key value, but a value within the columns are different? And as you'll see, this handles all three of those cases for you under the covers and will actually show you what the differences are of those three different combinations that you always need to do if you're comparing two different result sets. Uh, so that's very nice. Uh, result set has some uh, the, the same metadata. So did the column structures change between object A and object A uh, after a different evolution? Or the expected object, rather. So dependencies, fake table. Right? I don't have to write a create table statement because all I have to say is fake customers and it will make a copy of customers for me. That's it. I can now put data into my fake copy of customers. Procedures. Right? A lot of times code will call stored procedures. Well, the test that we may be doing really doesn't care what the guts of the stored procedure the subcall does. But I would like to know what parameters was that called with to make sure that my code that set up the call got my inputs to the right state before it did it. And spy procedure will allow you to do that. It will log the execution of a stored procedure call and the parameters and their values that were used for the execution. So now you can say, I executed this substored procedure. I expected it to be executed with these values for each of my parameters. Did that happen, yes or no? Uh, which is a really, really nice feature. Constraints, I can put constraints onto the table okay, um, to, so that I can exercise them. The good thing is, when I fake a table, it doesn't have any constraints. So they're not going to get in the way when I don't care about them for my particular test. Right? And there's a couple other things we'll see that are important about that fake table that help us get the code written and tested faster. Fake a function, again, and with the procedure and function um, stubs, you can have them specify what they're going to do in place of the execution. So now you can say, I want the output from this function to be this, or this store procedure to be this, and then the rest of your code will act upon that output or uh, result set that came from what you told the output of the stored procedure or the function to be. So, Fake table, you can see the, uh, the T SQL syntax for that below. And there's a number of options, right? There are no constraints. All columns are nullable. Now you don't have to worry about throwing an error because you didn't insert all 93 columns on the table. If you need to test three columns worth of data, you stub the table with a fake table. You put your three columns worth of values in there. All the rest are fine because there are no nulls and no constraints to blow up and throw an error, right? Makes your testing, writing of the test code go faster because you're not going to create these silly errors that uh, would otherwise get in the way, right? Now, what is identities? You can have it or not, right? If you don't care, you put, a, put one row in there or some number of rows where you don't care about the identity value. You don't even need to have that set up on the fake. Triggers, not, not created, uh, but you can add them in later if you write tests that now want to exercise the trigger. Otherwise, they don't get in the way, if you will. Right? Computed columns, right? all of these things, you get just a storage structure, if you will, of all nullable columns of the exact same data type as they were uh, for the original table. Right? No Tim table faking, um, but if you're doing that inside your code, uh, there's some, you know, you'll, you're going to have to manage d interrogating stuff inside the temp tables yourself, unfortunately. But uh, hopefully that doesn't cause too much problems for you. So there are a lot of cases where we expect our code to error, uh, and you can have tests that say, I expect an, an exception, and I expect this exception. I expect a primary key violation. Right? Or I expect uh, some other known type of error for a given set of inputs. I put in null for a particular value or input. I expect uh, an error to throw that says I just tried to insert nulls into a column that doesn't allow that. 
And this way you can test, easily test the you know, failures, the known expected failures of your code very easily. So we can do t sql t dot run with a test name, and that will execute that one test. We can run a test class, right? So we can run all of the customer's tests uh, in, in one shot by just saying run the customer's test class. Or, or we can say run all, which will run all existing tests for the entire uh, database that I'm executing the run all against. Some additional things, right? Don't repeat yourself. A lot of times, especially for a given test class, but in general, we are going to need certain things to be in place or set up or constructed, dictionary tables with values that we know we want to have in there or, or whatever it might be. Uh, you can create a setup uh, stored procedure for each class that will prep the stuff that you need for all or most of your tests, so you don't have to write that in every one of your tests. Very, very nice uh, piece of functionality there. Um, it tracks the last execution that was done in some private metadata in the T sql T uh, um, uh, part that will allow you to simply say run, and it will run the last test that was done. So when you're working hard to fix a particular piece of logic, you can just iteratively run the same test over and over until you get your code to where that particular test will pass. Right? So that's a, a nice thing to do. Some tips. You can filter uh, your object browser. Right? If you've never done this, uh, you can create filters in the object browser in Management Studio, so now you can just see the stuff that's related to the test class that you happen to be working on, uh, which is a, a nice thing to do. It allows you to get to where you want to go faster. If you have you know, databases with thousands of stored procedures or tables, that can be a really nice thing to not have to weed through the chaff to get to the objects of interest. Hotkeys, right? if you've never done this, you can you know, double click on an object in Control F1. Uh, I don't know if it'll work for the database, but uh, for test, you can have Control plus keys do things within Management Studio, such as SP Help and things like that. Um, so shortcut keys are a, a great thing to do. Uh, run all to get all of the tests run in the in a particular uh, database, right. and use templates. Right, because a lot of it's standard boilerplate stuff. Right, you set stuff up, you exercise, and then you do some form of comparison. Um, there's a number of tools and frameworks, including Management Studio itself, that will allow you to create templates, and you can just plug in values. It'll give you a little GUI box or whatever to to plug those in if you're doing templates. Um, do watch out for your transaction log size, because all of this is transactional. Right, begin tran do whatever you say needs to be done, and at the end you roll it back. Well, that's a set of transaction activity for the doing, and then another set for the undoing. Right? So especially if you're doing a lot of data manipulations within your tests, you do want to watch out for your uh, transaction log size. Um, this is especially important on dev and test boxes, but certainly in production as well, because most of my clients don't configure their production databases properly from a file size and certainly growth perspective. Right? And almost nobody changes any of the defaults in their dev and, and test and QA environments. And there are some devastatingly bad defaults in SQL Server. Right? One megabyte data file growth increments, anyone? Right? So do watch out for those type of things. So. Well, we're Microsoft developers here one way or another if you're touching SQL Server. So we like GUIs and colors and you know right clicks and drop downs and all this stuff. Uh, and T SQL T is all, call it command line, right? You gotta write T SQL to run T SQL code. Um, so 
there is a, a tool from Redgate that will put some a little bit of shine on this. Uh, and before we take a look at that, though, let's pop over and examine uh, how we might do uh, some of our testings here. Oh, here's a, uh, a look at how we might test tabular type output. Right? We'd have to build the table and put some data into it that we expect to be generated by our code. Um, and then we'd have to have different cases for whether we want a row over here but not over there, or the vice versa, a row in our actual but not in our expected. Uh, and then how do you actually compare that again, right? You need to save this to a file or put it in a temp table, a temp table. But then you have to write code that says exist here but not there, exist there but not here, and then exist in both but they're different. And that can be pretty complicated, uh, especially if you have a lot of columns that you need to do comparatives on, right? Uh, and then how do you handle things like null doesn't compare to an actual value, right? If you forget to handle that, you get a test that's invalid, right? So that's uh, a, some of the problems that you have to think about for value testing. So in AdventureWorks, right, we've, we've prepared our database by running the, the setup for T sequel T. Uh, we've built a KGB test class, right? Um, I do encourage you to use verbose names, right? You got to do the brackets, but you can look at the name of that test and pretty much know what it's going to do without knowing anything at all about the code. I give an input of two and I get an output that is in process, right? So this is uh, exercising that simple UDF that I showed you. So we set up our values and our things that we need. This might be stubbing things, uh, getting dictionaries in place, uh, et cetera. We exercise the code that we're seeking to test, one piece of the code for one particular input. And then we say, is our test uh, assertion uh, valid? So in this case, does A expected equal actual? And you have an option here. If it doesn't, you can give a meaningful uh, result set back or a message back to say, sales order status one did not return in process, right? And that it may be you that gets to evaluate this six months from now, but it may be somebody who just saw this for the first time. And the more helpful you can be, this is like self-documenting the, the test and even the code itself, because you know the code should present, present back in process for that particular value. And so another one is that my value one is approved, right? And we saw that in our code. So what test ran? It failed, right? And then our, the format of our test execution summary is a thing that we can use to feed uh, something that might be able to automatically interrogate this, right? So we had a, an execution name of a test, and the result is failure, OK? So pretty straightforward there. I can run that one is approved. It failed also, right? So if I go and then modify the code, somebody made a refactor, it broke the code. I'm going to get the code back into its, uh, its good state. And I'll flip back over to my tests. And I will run the first one. And now I get a test one executed, and it was success. And Hopefully, we'll get the same thing for passing in a one, and it's approved, and that test passed successfully also. Okay. So testing uh, view output, for example, right? So I stub out an expected table. I can do this as a temp object, or in this case, a permanent uh, object. Right, because it's begin tran, do whatever, roll back tran. So I'll create in this case a permanent table, put my expected values into the table, right? 
Um, if you don't have a copy of Ladin Project's SSMS Tools Pack, uh, I encourage you to get that because the generation of this type of data from existing tables is a simple right-click, generate inserts. So that could be a beneficial thing for you. We will act by putting the view values into my actual table. And this is the cool part right here. So assert equals table. My expected table is this. My actual table is this. And under the covers, it looks at all the rows and all the rows, and it gives you the ones that are over here that are not here at all, the ones that are not here that are over there, and the ones that are in both where there are differences, and it will show you the similar rows as well. And that's all the code we have to write to do all three sets of logic, which is very impressive, actually. So textual output, right? But the format of it, again, allows you to interrogate it with other tools. And here's the cool part. This is a row that exists only in one side of the coin. Here are two rows that exist only over here but not over here. Right? And all of these rows exist in both the expected and the actual and all of the values with nulls taken into account properly are the same in both tables. And that, that's really, really very nice. Right? So now, based on the fact that my test failed, right, I can go in and look at these rows to find out why do I have unexpected data in my test now. Is the test invalid because the business logic changed and I need to change the test? Or did my code refactor or creation do something that is unexpected? One of the two of those has to be correct, right? So if we take a look here, let's just change our test real quick. And I'm going to say, I, I did an analysis, and now I need this row to be in the expected set because of a business logic change. So if I recompile my test now, right, I just put a new row into that. Remember there were two on the one side and one on the other side that didn't exist in the other. And now I'll see down at the bottom of the set, this row had a right arrow where it was in the actual but not the expected. And so that shows me that I just fixed that particular flaw with the test. I still have two others that I need to go after to figure out what went sideways, right? So that's really powerful. Really, if you've never written code that does data validation between two different sets, it's difficult and gets more so the more columns that you have to do comparisons for, right? Now, one thing I would do probably, um, and, I, and I've done this before, is to go in and modify the comparison assert table equals and not show me the data that's the same between the two, right? Because that may not be important to me. What's really important is are there any rows where they're not exactly identical and in both sets? Right. So that's, and that's a pretty simple change to just go in, unencrypted SQL code, comment it out or change the where clause in the, the thing that generates this output, and now you've just improved the, the functionality of the framework for your benefit. Okay? So questions on that? Pretty, uh, pretty useful stuff. And we're really just touching the, you know, the, tip of the iceberg here with the functionality that you've got. And it does have good documentation on the website as well. Um, there's some, a couple of people have put together some really detailed blog posts about how to use this or how they used it in uh, creating some new module or functionality or doing a refactor. Uh, so back to the Redgate um, stuff. It is a paid product. Uh, but uh, it does come in the bundles. They've got a couple of bundles, so that's where you pick up the really nice value there. And if you're doing, if you're not doing source control of your all 
your database objects and all your database code, um, that's a significant shortcoming in your system. It really, really is. Uh, and Redgate and others have some tools, TFS and other things that will allow you to do that. If you're not, that really needs to become a high priority in your shop, I think. Okay. So you get a GUI. Uh, it's a Management Studio add-in. So the functionality is right there for you. Uh, color coding, the SQL cop tests will come in. Uh, actually, the SQL cop, I think, may be off of uh, the Redgate, um, but not the, the tsqlt.org. Uh, so we'll take a look here. We'll run the tables that start with TBL uh, using the GUI here. So we're, oh, wait a minute, down here, right? So it's, it's a tab within Management Studio, right? And you can pull it out like you can do other tabs and rearrange it and all that, right? So you can see each database that we have tests in shows up down here, right? Here's my uh, T-SQL T example, and there's the accelerator tests, and you can choose to run those as a unit. Um, we can take the uh, tables that start with TBL, and if we right-click, Always right click and always move your mouse over things to see what pops up or, or presents for you. Okay. So we can run a specific test, edit. Well, we can also double click on it to go directly to the code, right? So we don't have to right click and generate as, you know, modify script and, and things like that. Uh, then names and get rid of the test and things like that. Okay. So if we run it, we get output that says, starts with TBL on my laptop, failed, and it actually gives you a less than dot blog post link that says, here's why you may want to consider not doing that, right? And there are other, the other ones that are in there um, will have things like, you know, if it's database mail not enabled, you get a link maybe that might show how to enable database mail uh, or why you might want to do that. And clearly, you can build your own of these, right? To say, even if you're a DBA, you can use these to you know, enforce some standards, like find all the databases that have one megabyte data file growth increment and go tell people they need to fix that, right? So um, another thing, uh, from, a, from a class, you can run a whole class. Um, so that's kind of cool. And note, when they pass, you get green check marks, and if they fail, you get red X's. And if we want to see what the code is, we just double click, and there's the code for the test. All right, so that's kind of nice. And if you are using uh, you know, source control here and you modify an existing object, well, source control is going to pick that up and say, hey, you just changed this. You want to check it into your uh, source control. Um, it will, uh, the Redgate stuff will set up the version of T SQL T that they're built on. Um, and you can add the SQL cop test in there if you choose to. Okay. Continuous auto uh, integration, uh, really kind of a hot button these days, right? Especially if you're in an agile type shop where you're writing and modifying code very quickly. Um, I want to. Uh, do rapid build cycles, and I want to run my 63,000 whatever set of tests. And if everything passes, I got a green board. I advance it automatically into my sandbox system or up to the, the main development box or what have you. Um, those type of things are really important. And then if it does fail, there you know, may be various actions that you might want to take for notifications and, and things like that and stop the build or proceed. There's uh, the, the various systems that allow you to do this have different functionality, Octopus and Team City, and uh, there's some others out there that, that can help you out with that. Okay, So we'll take a look at a uh, stored procedure uh, stubbing. So I've got a, a sub-store procedure uh, that takes an input 
of a tiny integer, and it adds one to that and prints a box out. And then I've got a master stored procedure uh, that's going to adjust its input A and then sub out into my child stored procedure. And I create a test master sprock stub. Actually, I should call that test sub sprock sub, now that I, or stub, now that I think about it. So again, I set up my values that I need for parameters, give them values. I spy procedure, right? And again, what that's going to do is basically replace that code uh, so that it doesn't execute. And you have an option here, as I mentioned, to say what the output of that would be. So when it does fire, it will return back, say, if I wanted A to be 16 as a fixed known value so that I can exercise the rest of my code that does something intelligent when the value of that is 16, I can make sure that that happens, right? So um, that's one benefit. The other is it will log, and I can, in fact, interrogate the execution and the values of the parameters for that execution. And that is done in the uh, stored procedure name underscore spy procedure log. That creates the construct that stores the necessary metadata for the execution of that stored procedure. Uh, and then because I know what's going to be in there, because I know the parameters of the stored procedure, I can grab parameter A's actual execution time value and say that needs to be equal to my expected substore procedure uh, value. All right. So if I run this, I think I've compiled that already. And you can see here that the underscore ID underscore, that's the table that is the subsprock underscore spy procedure log table. I see that my value is A for that execution. And that's what we expect because the master store procedure takes A input, which is one, and adds one to it, and then calls the substore procedure. Well, that substore procedure would have added another one to it, so it would be three on output. But because I stubbed it, the execution didn't actually happen, and my test passed because I said A assert equals two, and it is, or at A, is equal to 2. And I got a pass on that particular execution. Now, the other I can do here, see if I can find it real quick. Uh, 5, I need 5. I think I have execute all. So here, run test class, right? Normally, I wouldn't have this. I just wanted to show you what the call is, so I would comment that out. Here's uh, the test class, the test case that does the data comparison outputs, right? And the others that just do scalar stuff, uh, there's all of my tests. One of them failed, and the others were successful. I can now do something intelligent based off of what I see here. And in fact, I can put this out to a file via you know, SQL command or whatever, and then have uh, a watcher in my build process go and check for uh, success or failure of my test and act accordingly. Okay. So until this came out, it was essentially impossible, not quite impossible, to do really, really rigorous database level testing, right? All, dealing with all the myriad things that are dealt with automatically with this, like nulls and um, the triggers and uh, constraints and those kind of things, it was really, really hard, especially for tabular result comparisons, right? Um, now, you, you really can do repeatable stuff because you can say, make a copy of that table and put some data in there and then do something with that or assert that this variable is equal to that. Um, call or don't call sub-objects. Um, so it, it's 
it used to be that nobody did it because it was just too hard. Or you had to have a, a tree worth of VMware snapshots to have the database in every little state for each different test that you need. Or you had to have a bunch of backups that you would restore that says, restore this backup for this set of tests because the data is in the state that I need it in, right? All that stuff was just really, really uh, hard or difficult to do. But now you really, you really can do it and you should. Right? We, we all know that logically if we think about it. We really need to test stuff in the database uh, so that when we change code, which happens a lot these days, right, uh, we know that we didn't have a regression and break something. Right? Or we know that I do, my business logic changed, I know this test needs to change and I will do that. And your tests also now become part of your entire source code ecosystem so that you can document that I just changed this test because business requirement 12.63.a said that this particular piece of logic changed and that becomes a part of your package and is you know verification in the future that things were done per business specs right? and it over time if if you have a huge application with no database unit test it's going to take a while, right? So you think about what are the most risky or the things that change the most, and you simply prioritize a list, and as you get a little time frame, or you bring in a, a third-party entity, right? Or you hire someone or a group to, to write tests for you based on what the specs are, right? Um, once you get it in place, it's much, much less overhead than it is for that initial big push if you have a large, complex application. But the larger and more complex your application is, the more chances you have that you're going to do something suboptimal when you execute a refactor. Right. So, any questions on what we got here? I think we're uh, right about, yep, right about the time. Anybody? Uh, if you would then, uh, take a minute or two and fill out the uh, evals. Bring them up here, and I will randomly pick one, or I will uh, pick one on purpose that has the largest denomination bill associated with it, uh, and you'll get the uh, some Beats headphones. So if you would do that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. There's a bunch of nice links up there for you as well. Um, some, of the, some of the blog posts there are very, very nice about how to effectively use the system and how to avoid some of the things that might trip you up uh, until you get used to using it. Okay, so go ahead and fill out your evals, bring them up, and we'll do a quick drawing. And then I, I don't know, do they have a drawing for the master a thing outside after this? They, they might. Thank you. You bet. Good session, you gave me all ones. <laughs> <laughs>